Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 15, The George Floyd Protests in Chicago, featuring Dan Hanrahan. Dan Hanrahan is a Chicago-based musician, translator, poet, performer, and teacher of Latin American literature. He has written essays for Counterpunch, El Beisman, The Mantle, and Op-Ed News, and stage music for Chicago's Spanish-language theater company, Colectivo El Pozo. He recently released Radical Songs for Rough Times, an album of original protest songs. Currently operating within Chicago's genre cross-fertilizing music scene, this multilingual Milwaukee native has built a following for his songs, stage performances, and theatrical scores. Dan and I talked on June 1st about activism, racism, politics, and the George Floyd protests, with special attention given to a recent action in Chicago that he attended personally. Just to sort of let people know where you're coming from, how would you yep. how would you kind of describe your your outlook or your perspective, like politically? I grew up Catholic. I was sent to a Jesuit high school. Huh, me too. And I, I, <laughs> oh, oh God, we survived. We survived. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, Marquette University High School. I yeah that's a, probably a in 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 its entirety would be a, a separate um, podcast conversation. But regarding politically, uh, they, this was in the eighties. It was during liberation theology, and among the Jesuits, um, there was a number of liberation theologians, and uh, I and they were you know, let's get back to the Sermon on the Mount. Let's get back to the Beatitudes, and. Um, I, I I really related to it. I took it pretty seriously. I didn't not not so much the mythology, but but certainly the teachings. And so that I think that was in the mix. And then uh, in, in in college, I had a sociology class. This guy said, uh, "Oh, if you take Rosidi's class, your mind will be shattered and you'll never be the same." What? What do you really? How's that possible? And I did, and that's what happened. And um, it, it, his Rosides had this thing of um, there's no human nature; it's all acculturated. And and probably what you think about the United States is uh, myth. And so he would come at us with like, please, please, since we've been in this class today. Um, five different women have been assaulted and he would just throw these statistics that slowly um, dissolved um, my belief in, in the greatness of the U S if I had ever believed it, this then. And, and so I've been um, pretty far on the left uh, for a long time. And I've always related as an artist and as a poet, I've always related to um anarchy and anarchism as a political philosophy uh, because it seemed to offer the most freedom um, as again as assuming people have a bedrock understanding of how people should relate to each other um, with compassion and empathy and along with that um, there's actually a political side to surrealism which is all power to the imagination and that's been very important to me. Then in 2010, I read a book by someone who's not really um, super beloved at the moment by people in my political camp, uh, Bill, Bill McKibben's book, Earth, E-A-A-R-T-H. And, and for whatever his um, issues are with how we should respond to um, climate change, he, he's interestingly he doesn't really have any illusions about how dire it is <laughs> so yeah so that's once, true you know and so once i once i read that book then that set me into a, a much 
greener direction um, and ultimately to um, a lot of um, um, anarcho-primitivism and things like that. So that's some of my back background. And then just working in the arts and just kind of growing up and living where I've lived, Milwaukee, Baltimore, Chicago, and, and being a musician, um, I think un, being being a, trying to be pretty serious about racial injustice has been an ongoing thing for me as well. I speak Spanish and Portuguese, and I translate and work with a lot of Afro-Brazilian writers, and uh, they're dealing with almost identical issues at the moment. It's, it's quite dire down there. Uh, in Brazil, for example, you mean? Correct, correct, and and so um, that's that's part of my political pursuits and awareness as well. Is is um, I have a Portuguese background on my mother's side, and I became really deeply interested and connected to Brazil. I married a Brazilian woman. I'm not with her anymore, but. Um, and what Afro-Brazilians are dealing with are a remarkable number of similar issues that it, it seems that African-Americans are dealing with as well. And so when when the snuff film of, of George Floyd came out, um, yeah, it was shattered. <laughs> Probably everyone was. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's some yeah. difficult viewing for sure. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then on top of, you know, just the whole history of everything, but then also, right. you know, current uh, circumstances, I, you know, it's not really surprising to see the response that we've seen, the the vigorousness of it. No, no, I, I have not been su surprised. This, uh, you know, it, there, there's pro there must be things going on you know i'm i feel like i'm pretty uh, pretty aware of how white supremacy operates in this society but i not as aware as not as aware as i thought um with i feel like my eyes are kind of getting open to how it, it seems again if people can call me naive but it, it's really becoming clear to me now how it it, it seems to be a pretty very strong subculture within police departments. And I don't just mean your garden variety American racism. I'm talking about it's this this KKK style racial hatred seems to ha I mean, imagine going to work where you, there were people like that. It's unimaginable to me. I've worked in schools and nonprofits my whole life. And yet this seems to be what we're starting to see is the workplace of so many of these police departments. Yeah, I lived in Portland, Oregon for about 10 years, uh, starting in 2001. And there was a police officer there, uh, Kroger, I believe his last name was, or Kruger. And he was caught, uh, he had ended up building a shrine to Nazis up on one of the buttes in one of the public parks in like a sort of tucked away area. Yeah, and they, they caught him, you know. Um and, you know, there was lots of back and forth with it. And, of course, the police union came to defend him and this and that. And I can't remember exactly why it all how, – how what the whole story was. But eventually right. what happened is that in the settlement that ended up happening, um, he um, is having that erased from his police record. Oh, my God. Wow. That's – just shocking. I mean, and that's that's this that's the deal. That's how this stuff has been handled with a slap on the wrist. If that, so what we're seeing seeing this week is inevitable. It's inevitable. It might even be late in coming. And um, I, yeah, I mean, I think that's self evident at this point. Yeah, and I definitely hear you too when you say that you're still learning about white supremacy and, and how it works. I definitely feel the same way. Uh, I've really been finding it very helpful, you know, over the last few years to read the, um, the black agenda report. Um, oh, yeah. and, uh, I've been listening to the black agenda radio podcast lately. Oh. That one's especially good. They have some really good guests on there, like 
three or four oh, okay. guests per episode. Uh, it looks a mix of activists and um, academics. And I just have my eyes opened every single time I I listen to it. And, you know, once you get over the part of like, oh, gosh, I, I feel stupid for not knowing this stuff. And I'm just like, well, okay. guess what? I, I just don't know this stuff and I'm going to learn it now. That's and that's right. fine. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's cool. That's cool. Um, you know, we we can seek to to be aware, and yet you you and I both are of the pink hued variety, so we're not going to be the target of most of this stuff. And uh, yeah, it seems like uh, there's a lot of people uh, of of my ilk who like. I don't actually use the adjective woke, but for lack of a better word, I'm woke. Yeah, well, you weren't woke enough because it's even worse than you thought. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. Right. So there in, in Chicago, there's been, you know, quite, quite, a, quite a scene happening then, I guess. Big time. Yeah. Yeah. For, and, and for a long time, the south side of Chicago has been a cultural force and powerhouse for African-American culture for 100 years and for activism. And um, the 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 awareness, the consciousness, and even some of the um, some of the the structures are in place to to respond. The dialogue is is engaged and ignited, and so you know it didn't didn't take long for people to converge upon downtown and try to make a statement. Right, because there's been a recent history there as well of some really egregious behavior That's by the police the thing, you know i would <laughs> america being what america is this this kind of it's just it's probably always been a dystopia dystopia depending on uh who you are and what your demographic is i think that's safe to say but in some ways it seems to be on the decline in, in terms of its dystopian identity so i'm living in baltimore and 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 Freddie Gray was murdered largely on video by Baltimore cops, and and our city went into a full blown rebellion, and uh, that was that had my head spinning enough. And meanwhile, uh, concurrent in time, uh, Chicago cops had um, done. I mean, what can you call it? it the most savage and barb barbaric and demented act possible as they track down Laquan McDonald and the video shockingly or not shockingly, I should say it was buried by probably a combo of Ram, Ram Emanuel, the mayor and the police chief at that time. It did come to light. And uh, that guy, um, Van Dyke, he's in prison for six and a half years now. But yeah, this is hot on the heels of that. And then, I mean, it's kind of an endless list. I mean, Fred Hampton was, was murdered here uh, by a combination of Chicago cops and the FBI. And then you had John Birch, who was more of the ilk of the Chauvin type, the guy in um, the guy who's, who's in the news right now in Minnesota, which is that John Birch was a, stone cold torturer and sadist who had a little headquarters set up for more than 20 years on the south side in his precinct and the suspects would come in and the torture would start and um it really truly truly disturbing stuff out of i mean let's face it what we saw on the video last week and what this people like burge are doing is similar two accounts you'll hear of when the brown shirts and the nazis marched into ghettos and they did these flamboyantly sadistic things and yes so chicago has a history of somehow trying to muddle through that type of trauma right and you know as people in the year 2020 we look back and we're like oh like it totally would have been the right thing to do to fight back against the yeah. brown shirts Right, you know, and yet, <laughs> and yet we're we're unable to we're unable to see how that relates to our time. That's tremendous. I mean, that's that's very starkly said. I mean, it's not. You can ask anyone 
you know, you can ask my right wing father, who I love dearly, but who politically is is not coherent. But I could even ask him, wouldn't it be right to fight against the brown shirts when they come into a Jewish ghetto and do these flamboyantly sadistic things? And he would say yes. And and what, what the deal is what Chauvin and Burge and so many of these things that are coming to light are, they're the equivalent. And I, I, I'm not using the Nazi comparison because it's an easy cliche to go to, but rather it's the first one that I think of be, because of the nature of it, because of the brazen nature of it, because of the almost almost vocational nature of it. This is this is what, what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to really hurt these people and kill them. Right. So, you know, I, this again, you know, I don't want to get histrionic about it, but it is evil. I mean, let's we, we you know that it, we're going to use the E word here because we're, we're witnessing evil. And so to bring it back to your point, um, that being the case, responding very strongly to it, however, that manifests is makes all the sense in the world. Right. And so you you headed downtown, uh, what, a couple nights ago or something like that? Yes, that probably. Yeah, that was Saturday. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm still kind of working remotely and stuff. And I didn't I didn't get in touch with folks who were doing something on Friday night. But, uh, you know, via some Facebook groups, I heard about stuff going on Saturday. Again, I had like, you know, it's like everybody's um, um, reality when it comes to activism is we have oftentimes full-time lives, <laughs> family, friends, work, job, art, and then, you know, and but you got to make time for the activism when you can, and some people can, some people can't. I was able to late in the day on Saturday, and I, 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 I drove, which <laughs> in retrospect, that was potentially a pretty pivotal decision because Mayor Lightfoot shut down public transit around 6 30 p.m and i wasn't leaving till 7 30 p.m uh so i would have been walking home because it was you know areas of the downtown were shut off to cars and whatnot so i parked on the outskirts of downtown finally made my way over to directly across the river from uh trump tower so i'm on the south side of river the river and trump tower is on the north side and i'm basically at the chicago river state street and wacker drive runs along the river and that's where folks were at and all of the bridges uh that that span the chicago river to connect the city uh they were up and the, and the bells were ringing except for one which was the state state one which um protesters occupied thank god or there wouldn't be any crossing the river I mean, and so and so thank you yeah, really thank god and so i got up there and again on the south side of the river is sort of folks congregating lots of great and inspiring signs and lots of folks as you cross the bridge that's when the action was potentially ready to pop because um i, I enter a kind of this corporate plaza thing that's on the river it's all spray painted up uh with some pretty inspiring graffiti and then here's the crowd of people and facing west is just a huge phalanx of very heavily outfitted uh, Chicago cops uh, with shields and helmets, and and we're we're squared off basically. Right, and do you have a, an idea about like maybe approximately how many protesters there were? Yeah, um, at that point, see, this is five thirty in the day. The protests had started at two in different parts of the city, like in Little Village, uh, La Villita. There was kind of a car caravan for the Corona thing, and then. So by the time I got there, between one and 2,000, maybe 1,500, 1,200 um, would be my estimate, might be more. Um, and, 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 and a healthy, healthy serving of Chicago cops. I mean, once I got a look at them, you know, they were about two or three deep and hundreds of feet across uh, in a couple different places, and by the time, not soon after my arriving there, um, the the standard um, recorded announcement starts going, which is, "You are here, 
gathered unlawfully. You must disperse now or you will be subject to arrest, just playing over and over. And, you know, that was my cue to me that, okay, I'm 53. Everyone around me is probably 28. Uh, they might be able to hustle this better than me. Um, I've got, you know, I've got anxiety disorders that kick in at times. And so trying to be somewhat prudent, I started to just back off of that particular um, scene and then I'm back kind of close to the bridge and everyone is cheering I think maybe a cop had uh, skidded out on his bike because you had what you had was um, a large police boat in the river you had suited up cops on the street you had cops on bikes you had cops in cars and you had cops in the air with at least one or two choppers up ahead. So so things are pretty well I mean that's the whole thing, isn't it? This is a priority. <laughs> right. <laughs> these <laughs> these cities. I mean I mean someone made the hey, there's a million points you could certainly make about it, but when we saw what frontline doctors and nurses are trying to deal with uh as regards protective equipment for corona, I mean talk about equipment Good Lord, it looked like the Roman legions. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. And so that's quite evident. And now I'm on the I'm on State Street again on the north side. And um, then then folks just start stampeding, running like crazy. I couldn't see why, but it was obvious that we don't want to get snatched up by the cops. So I take off running a couple blocks north. Um, cools down for a minute. And I say, I better peel off and head back to my car and I start heading west because I'm on the outskirts of the west side of the city and uh, and then another stampede I mean if you've ever seen the uh, the clips of people running with the bulls that level of holy shit you know I don't want a horn in my ass uh -huh. is is what is, is what the energy was <laughs> and and so uh, I was out of there I talked to some some folks a little bit about what they thought might have been going on, and then uh, I, I headed out of there. So I was um, – because had I remained – I mean, I knew how this was going to play out. If I had remained and hadn't headed back to my car, the, the um, running with the bulls stampedes would happen again and would happen again. And at some point, a cop might catch up to me and I might get arrested and again – there's been times in my life when I've been in such a position psychologically and physically where getting arrested by the Chicago cops and potentially ending up in Cook County Jail for a little bit would be manageable. Um, this wasn't that day. So what I did end up hearing, which is really disturbing, is that – um, the, 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 the buses are not running, the trains are not running. So now protesters are stuck in downtown. And so I don't honestly know the strategy that's being employed by the city of Chicago, but some people are saying, well, it appears that their protesters are arriving then you cut off transit, you, you, you raise all the bridges. So now they're geographically stuck. So even even if you want to leave when curfew hits at 8 or 8.30, it might be difficult. And certainly um, folks are getting picked up and arrested pretty quickly. In a state of shock after the war... We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... So there was a curfew that started this Saturday or, or yeah. started uh -huh, 8 o'clock? At least... It at least started Saturday. It may have started Friday, but I think it may—I think it was Saturday at eight o'clock, eight thirty, basically sundown. So I think it was eight thirty. And um, some people have—I I would put it into three camps. Some people have decided to get out of there before eight thirty, 
and have succeeded. Some people have decided to remain and then maybe, okay, 10 o'clock, 1030, I'm going to get out of here. And it's been quite hard to get out of there as the bridges are pulled up and as uh, transportation is not running. And then other people have say, I'm, I'm here for the duration, you know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay un, until I go home in the morning. Right. And so did you um, um, did you happen to see any of the news coverage of what was going on, the local oh, news coverage? The, see, the local news coverage, I've been following mostly indie, indie media. We have a, a really awesome activist here who's – who has something called um, Gay Liberation TV. His name is Andy Thayer, uh, T-H-A-Y-E-R. And he's, you know, since the days of ACT UP, he's been a really visible, truly uh, independent media presence in Chicago. So I, he's, he's down there every day, and I've been watching what, what he's been covering. I would... I would like to take a look at what's going on mainstream wise. I think it'll what I know about Chicago media is that it, it'll be kind of a real mix like you what I've seen in the past is you'll have one kind of very truthful this is what's happening story and then some other kind of downplaying things. As far as as far as how are they depicting um vandalism, arson, looting, um yeah, I don't even know. Again, what I've been getting has been on, I'm also on a, a Facebook group called uh, Pilsen Neighborhood. And that's that's kind of the the art cultural hub of Latin Chicago is, is the Pilsen Neighborhood. And so I'm getting some firsthand things of stuff that's happening there in Little Village, which is another uh, traditionally Mexican working class neighborhood. And um, and just again more more uh, Facebook posts from people who are down there. But it would, yeah. I mean, now you, you've got me curious. I, I would like to see how the media is covering, uh, the, rather the mainstream media is. Right. Yeah. I mean, they they typically do a really piss poor job of it. You know, That's because. True. That's because cool. yeah, I mean their their whole thing is to defend the status quo. So of course they're going to be as skeptical as they as they can be. But yeah, so there's been reports from Minneapolis and also I believe Portland at this point that another factor that's been happening in those places has been white supremacists coming in and inserting themselves into the middle of the action, and that that sure. of course has been causing a lot more problems. Has that been an element in Chicago yet? That's yeah, it's such an interesting question, and not that I've seen. I mean, I've I've been down there. I've had my ear to the ground pretty well, and it, it's quite possible that it's happening somewhere to some degree in Chicago, to the extent that it's not come to my attention and it's not really jumping out as as a as a major issue again to to my consciousness, is because I think. Um, this Trump doesn't come to this town. He was chased out of this town. He was chased out of um, I don't think he was even able to do his speech at the UIC uh, arena in in right, right north uh, south of downtown Chicago. Th you know, to say this is a blue town. Oh, we're blue. No, it, we're even close. We're in between red and blue. A lot of this city and and black for that matter. Um and so because this is such an immigrant hub and because this is such an African-American stronghold, it, it is a lot harder for Nazis to insert themselves into the mess. That's just a practical matter. And, and so practically speaking, they're going to this will not be their first destination. And thank God. I mean, it's it's great. I mean, I was down again. I was among uh, between a thousand, two thousand folks on, on Saturday. And granted, they're trying to go undercover. But, you know, again, it didn't it would be tough. It would be tough. Right. That's good to hear. What was the yeah. um, mix of people like at the among well, the protesters? Yeah. yeah and, you know, because I've been. <clears throat> particularly since the Gulf War when I was at protests here in around 2001, 
I've been out at different protests over the years in different cities. Um, and, and I always kind of look at that. Traditionally, it's interesting whether it's been climate change, anti-fracking stuff or anti-war stuff. I'll go out and it'll be a mix of folks um, – and then there'll always be a little contingent of the the boomers who had been uh, probably Vietnam War activists, anti-war activists. And this was actually the first time there was not one. So at me as a Gen Xer was kind of the oldest of the old guard. So the boomers have kind of um, are receded a little bit just because they're getting older. I know I have a a radical friend in Milwaukee who has announced as much. So then who was there was um, folks 98% in their 20s and 30s and young, 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 uh, which brought a great energy. And again, Chicago being Chicago, um, ethnically and racially represented was utterly diverse was again just a a very energizing feeling so uh young extremely diverse in ethnically racially and in in terms of gender and uh really uh creative signs (laughs) as well oh that's cool did you get a chance to take any pictures yeah yeah i gotta still sort through some of them um i put up some pictures of more like an art shot of the the heavily armed shock troops of the Chicago PD um, right in the background of this sculpture garden that has these kind of contorted looking business downtown workers uh, carved out of wood with with neckties huh. and it was quite a, quite a juxtaposition. I mean, it's supposed to be like, hey, this is, you know, normally this is our little um, uh, pay on to the workers. They're down here clicking away on those those computers. And then and this uh, took on a different meaning in this context. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've been uh, you've been a, you're a musician, too. And a lot of uh, your politics comes into your music. Definitely. Definitely. Um, as, as things started to, you know, so I've always, my music has always um, had elements of kind of surrealist poetry and kind of an anarchist energy. And then sometimes I've been able to incorporate actual political events that are occurring that I could, you could more name. And then uh, a few years ago, as this Trump thing started to really heat up, as did the um, extrajudicial killings of unarmed black people and the climate thing. It just has kind of taken over, and I, I put together a collection called Radical Songs for Rough Times. I worked very hard on that, studying ballads from Scotland that are collected in a book called The Child Ballads, as well as how some... Spanish language um, songwriters from Cuba, they were called the Nueva Troba, the New Troubadours, um, like Silvio Rodriguez, were dealing with hard, heavy duty political issues, but maintaining their poetic heart. And that's, I think Bertolt Brecht is another one. It's this interesting zone that you can get into. And of course, Brecht is writing in Germany in the 30s. And, and again, he's probably just this bon vivant poetry guy but as things are getting grimmer and grimmer he's, he's engaged he's engaged and and so um then on this album there is a, a song about ferguson again i i look to these kind of the the ballad form is a very good form i think for dealing with tragedy and 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 naming names Ballads rely on names. Say say a person's complete name, and it becomes part of the poetry. And so there is one for um, Michael Brown and Ferguson. There's a song for uh, Freddie Gray called "The Ghosts of Baltimore," and then um, then there's a couple songs in Spanish, one in Portuguese, and it, you know it, uh, probably doing every album like that would be kind of hard. But I think. I think it's good to have it as part of your creative work. 
Right. Well, speaking of, you know, grimmer and grimmer times, it does <laughs> seem like that's where we're at. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Thank you. I would say that is the trajectory. And it's it's pretty insane to be reading uh, from some Facebook friends who are political activists and, and saying, well, yeah, that's why I moved to France four years ago. Get your passport. Make sure you have your passport. Oh, got to have the passport. And then another vlogger woman I know is a, a black activist. Uh, she said uh, it, she's calling it Black Exodus, and she's actually really wanting to document um, a movement of black people out of this country, literally precisely because of the type of event that happened on Monday night in Minneapolis. Right. Yeah. And I, 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 I know who you're talking about with that first yes. post about talking about move to, to moving yes. to France. Yeah. I'd like to bring her onto the podcast too. Absolutely. Sometime. Absolutely. And, and I think that, that, yeah, let's just touch on that one for a moment. I think that, that, um, it's, it's not a, it's not a joke and it's not something to take lightly. This whole, yeah. uh, threat to declare quote Antifa, mm -hmm. uh, a terrorist organization. Well, thank you for mentioning. I mean, right. And I'm actually glad you said that in such plain speak because I'm not even there yet. I'm like, what? That doesn't I don't even get that. OK, I'm an anti-fascist. What is he talking about? Blah, blah, blah. And you're saying, no, that could if if that's taken literally, it could mean people like me and you who are anti-fascist activists could could be dealt with by the state. Is that sort of what you're hinting? Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, you know, at, at one level, it's it's nonsense because what he says, right. he's, he's claiming that there's a group, you know, and and of course there is no there is no group, that, right. you know. That's that's what exactly. Right. Yeah, you know, I mean, now Fox News presents it as though it's a group, and so does the so that's does true. the right wing media, you know, and you know, I you know personally know a couple of people who believe that stuff and who really okay. think that's that right. Antifa is an official organization that's funded by George Soros, you know. <laughs> And I mean, okay. we we, okay. we know that's bullshit, right? We know that's bullshit. But, you know, despite that, like if, if he actually does manage to do some sort of law or or whatever, well, that's definitely okay. going to have an effect. And, right. you know, I you. yeah, they'll start sweeping. They'll start sweeping people up in, right. in some way, you that's know. Right. I mean, we yeah. should say we should say sweeping more people up because, of course, they've been well, sweeping right. people up for decades. Yeah. That's why we have the largest prison population in the world. That's true. Right. Exactly. OK. I, yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So just extend it out a bit more. Extend it out a bit more. We've yeah. had the dragnet. We've had the dragnet out, particularly for young African-American men. Uh, take care of that that way. Keep them locked up. Keep them in this insane, dismal spiral of, of the the criminal justice system, so called, totally a misnomer. And, and now let's extend it out a bit, you know, because obviously they've, you know, from their perspective, we are still there's still problems, and we we would constitute that problem, and they're they're dealing with uh, the different quote unquote problems, which is anyone who's not a very backwards thinking white man. Right. Right. And see, they already did you. this Thank successfully you. with, you know, when when uh, Bill Clinton had, you know, certain types of environmental and animal rights activists declared to be That's terrorists. Right. Oh, my God, you're right. Mm -hmm. The Green Scare that uh, Will Potter wrote about is right. already there. The, the, the blueprint is there. They took people doing animal liberation. And now there's somehow the, they're these scary terrorists. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah, mean, yeah, you know, yeah. I, you know, I, I mean, maybe you heard of, you know, Trey Arrow, who, uh, was, yes, yeah, I right. Heard. I mean, I'm a personal friend of, you know, okay. of his in Portland, you know, so, so yeah, I have a friend who's a, who's, you know, he's officially and legally and, you know, a convicted eco terrorist. Oh, you know, my God. Right? And so oh. for the rest of his life, he can't legally live someplace unless he tells the person, what the, the, that's true he can't you know any job application he has to say that he's a convicted ego terrorist and now he has friends okay. you know yeah uh, who 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 you know uh, take care of him and, and 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 who help out and this and that and so you know he's able to do that because he has some kind of network but you know still obviously you know this really limits you know I see. his ability to live life and so that's you know of course 
how will they do that here? Well, you know, we'll see. And of course, what's different now this time that wasn't going on with the green scares that now we also have social media as well. True. That's right. That's big. That's Which big. is a big database showing connections between people. Yes, and, indeed. You know, right, I did you? Yeah, did you ever click like on something that was about Antifa? Uh -oh. Okay. And then, who are the right. people who are friends with you? Who 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 clicked something on? You know what I mean? And like, so now you know, and they've got these algorithms, right? So 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 they can they can come up with a list out of there if they want to. I mean, you know, don't tell right. me that social media is going to be on our side if it no. comes down to it. Of course not. No, they're gonna lay down as quickly as possible if need be okay yeah. right right okay yeah yeah no this is a good heads up it's a good heads up that you're telling me to you know kind of think twice and that anyone who's going to hear this podcast is is to start thinking tactically as regards that that whole thing if 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 for example the the antifa is going to be treated treated as terrorists blah 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 yeah i got you yeah, and that's what our French friend was was um, warning us about. With uh, her post. Uh, there you go. I was about to say exactly. Yeah, that for right to get on social media and start declaring that uh, your allegiance to Antifa might not be that prudent at the moment. No, it's it's different because of course all oh. of these things are now kept in a database forever. You know. Wow, wow, that's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. They're in the cloud. They're in the numinous cloud. <laughs> <Whatever>. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the cloud full of Zeus's thunderbolts, I think. <laughs> right. Right. Basic. Yeah. Cool. So I thought it would be it would be kind of cool um, at the uh, uh, I, uh, I'm doing some 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 farming down here, as you know, and I, I've actually got a lot of stuff I need to get to still. So. Um, sure. Uh, but I wanted to put at the end of, of this episode here, I wanted to, to put on, you know, one of your one of your songs. I was figuring on just like taking a recording and editing in at the end, probably. Um, Good. So I was just wanting to um, you can tell me what it is that you want me okay. to do that with. And then and then introduce that, you know, tell us about that song. And also, of course, tell people where they can go and find, you know, their music, your music. Very good. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Um, I'm going to actually grab my CD cover as we're talking. And because, you know, I'm leaning, um, you know, given given the, the really nasty stuff we're confronting at the moment, um, as I've got the ballad of, of another situation like this. Um, so it just depends where we want to go. So if we if we. If you choose upon uh, editing that, go out on a, a, a poignant and stark note that kind of references this um, tragic moment, uh, but I don't think in a hopeless way. Uh, the Ghosts of Baltimore is a um, is a is a remembrance of Freddie Gray in Baltimore, and then uh, maybe maybe. If, you, if you're feeling otherwise, or if a listener wants to check out something different, um, uh, as far as since um, we were speaking of rebellion and resistance uh, for the last half hour, there is a song called Ned Ludd and Queen Mab about uh, the great time of resistance against the, um, the industrialization of England. So I think uh, given given the, the really solemn topic that we're dealing with presently, it'll be the ghosts of Baltimore. And, uh, you know, to dedicate it to George Floyd and to Freddie Gray and to all of the other victims of police violence. Cool. And people can go find this on SoundCloud? So the album is available on Bandcamp is the best place. Just put in uh, Dan Hanrahan and okay. or you can even yeah Dan Hanrahan slash Bandcamp will get you there. And I did get it onto the Spotify platform. Radical Songs for Rough Time is up there. I think uh, individual songs, kind of song by song, is on YouTube as well. Okay, well I'll put uh, links in the and um, you can maybe send them to me and I'll put them in the in the show notes. I will. So yeah, fantastic. Cool. Okay. And then, thanks for joining me today, Dan. I really appreciate it. And we'll be going out today with your song, The Ghosts of Baltimore. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Freddie Gray, one hour and day, 
Onto the streets of West Baltimore Though he didn't know He was in the sights Of a vast and hateful might He told his sister goodbye He gazed toward the sun Nobody knew The deed to be done To Freddie Gray His mother's only son West Baltimore That April day On the same streets Frederick Douglass walked Then escaped from Old Baltimore on our run in 2015 when they open up the van put you on the floor it's a boot to the back it's a blow to the head then it's a rough ride then you wind up dead in old Baltimore some ghosts won't go away that day It's a prayer in the wind It's a tear on the pavement It's demanding the truth from the government In old Baltimore Some ghosts won't go away Like the ones that killed Freddie Gray that day Prayer in the wind, it's a tear on the pavement, it's a man in the truth from the government in old Baltimore. Some ghosts won't go away like the ones that killed Freddie Gray that day. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.